Good morning, everyone. I think we should, uh, should get started. We're already uh, running a bit late. Um, the rest of the students coming in, they'll probably have to take the back door, but that's uh, their problem, I suppose. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here to the uh, 11th lecture of the course. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, funding, uh, about the organizational uh, structures, and about the teams. Essentially today I'll be telling you about how to get started. If you want to start your company tomorrow, a few days from now, I'll be telling you about exactly what to do in that case. So um, the agenda is as follows. Uh, we'll be starting out uh, with uh, an intro to Startups DTU, DTU's uh, own uh, student organization within entrepreneurship. I'll be telling you a bit more about that in a second. Um, then I'll be talking a bit about starting a company, uh, the different company types in Denmark, and uh, what to remember and what to include in your, um, uh, your process of starting a company. Then we'll take a quick break. And uh, after that, I'll be talking about how to build a team, how to actually uh, create a proper dynamic for the team before, team before you uh, get too far into the process. Um, and uh, in you know, extension of that, an uh, uh, acquaintance of mine, uh, Jens Christian Fode from an organization, Connect Denmark, uh, will be talking and telling you about uh, his organization. Uh, which is going to be really interesting to you as well. Uh, after that, we have the third break, uh, and uh, I'll be having a bit of a long lecture after that about funding sources and the funding strategies. I think that's important to you as well, so uh, listen up. And finally, after that, we'll have another guest lecture from Vextus uh, Greater Copenhagen, a guy called Christian Lund. Again, an organization that you should be very much aware of in starting a company because they'll be able to help you with a lot of different things. But um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Stardust DTU and uh, Christopher James uh, Lucia, who is uh, the CEO of uh, this very exciting student organization that uh, you should all also be very much aware of. So uh, Christopher, the floor is yours. There you so, go. Yep, yeah, the sound is on, good. Yes, it Thank is. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the nice introduction. As uh, mentioned before, I'm Christopher, and I'm the director of uh, Startups DTU, uh, the student-run uh, entrepreneurial organization here at DTU. See if it works. Oh, it did. So who are we? We are a non-profit uh, volunteer organization where we have an entrepreneurial network that spans every Danish university. And our goal is, of course, always to become global uh, so we can compete on the global market. Uh, and uh, this January, we started up an idea house or an incubator, uh, bottom up, so it's run by students for students, where we focus on uh, co curriculum activities uh, with an emphasis on student run innovation. Uh, some of the activities that we have done so far is uh, having a, a small conference uh, about uh, green uh, entrepreneurship. We have had uh, from patent to business plan together with uh, CBS. We have our entrepreneurship on the road and uh, beating the elite case competition and so on. And we, of course, plan a lot of more stuff. One thing that was really cool was this uh, IP event we had, where we had some uh, corporate lawyers out talking about how you could protect your ideas, not necessarily only using patents, but also using uh, copyright and uh, stuff like that. And of course, uh, corporate secrets, which was the cheapest solution. Um, so what we do is that if we just take a simple linear projection of entrepreneurship, it is simply having an idea projected onto society, test it and commercialize it, and hopefully make some money at some point. Where we come in is this uh, early stage project. Let's see. Yeah. This early stage projection system, where we would like to facilitate that uh, projection onto society, so you easier can test your system without, uh, yeah, selling off all of your family fortune before you can start commercializing. And in order to do that, we have some in-house resources that we give away for free, if you, of course, uh, get accepted by our program. Uh, how we do this is that we have, uh, first of all, some office space down at uh, DTU 101, and hopefully we'll expand uh, very soon. Uh, we have our network that covers uh, all of the Danish universities. Also, we have uh, collaborations with professional incubators. We have collaborations with uh, uh, CSC, which is uh, mainly uh, business developers at uh, CBS. 
We have uh, some uh, corporate partners, which is this corporate law firm, Lesson Ricard, I mentioned about, that offers free legal advice. KPMG, that gives us some uh, free auditing, which is very important when you fund a company. And then we have uh, Copenhagen Business Center. They actually offer uh, free sparring with a business developer that can tell you about the first steps of funding and finding uh, how your shape of the company should be. And then we uh, work together with uh, Shell, which is this uh, inter-university uh, organization that uh, promotes uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and then we have a very deep mentoring program where we uh, uh, focus on uh, not only tech-savvy people, but also people who are serial entrepreneurs and people who have a background in marketing and design, so we can give you the best uh, feedback needed. So the entrepreneurial process is always to find this sweet spot between what the investors want to give you money for, what your own skill sets or your team skill sets are, and what the needs of the society is. So in order to be a, the, the quick success, it's always finding the sweet spot. And this always start with some kind of innovation. What can we do new? If, if we talk about, of course, knowledge-based entrepreneurship. And this can uh, spring out of uh, research or teaching, or simply just sitting and hope over a fancy cognac and philosophizing over what it is you're doing. And then we find some kind of uh, application for it, a customer need, and then we prototype it. Um, and then we have to find some kind of market and uh, see if the production is actually viable and uh, scalable to fit the market needs. Uh, and then we have to protect the intellectual property so we don't get uh, yeah, beaten by the big corporate uh, companies out there. And that is most often done by patenting stuff. Uh, that is, of course, a very costly affair. So this is something uh, we normally uh, yeah, advise people to, to take a very careful look at before looking into a patent. Because as soon as you patent it, you also make all of your technology uh, accessible to the public, meaning that it's uh, easy to... Uh, find a way around it. So it could be a benefit of maybe keeping it secret a little bit longer to found the funding or leasing of your uh, patent. So. And uh, in order to, to see the philosophy of entrepreneurship, uh, I heard this uh, model of the chicken head, uh, or chicken, headless chicken model from uh, the CEO or the former CEO of Podio, where he said that uh, in order to be a good entrepreneur, you need to be smart. But if you're too smart and don't have any body, you don't move anywhere. So you don't act on what is happening on the market. But if you're only acting, you don't think about what you're doing. So you start just running around in circles and, no, and not going anywhere. So we need a good balance between your action and reflection in order to become a full chicken and actually be a successful company. And I think that's a very novel way of actually saying that this thing of being an entrepreneur is just going out there headless and uh, going at it and gambling away all of your money is not true. It has to be a well-calculated risk you're taking in order to be a successful entrepreneur. So the key factors of all of this will always be the team. You have to build up your skill sets in order to fill that sweet spot that I talked about earlier. The passion. If you don't have the passion to run with it, it is, it is a risk. And uh, if you don't have the passion, it's not, it's not a good thing to take any risk. Timing. The timing of, uh, of executing of different steps of your entrepreneurial process is a key factor. Without the timing, we don't really know, or you, 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 you gamble away at the wrong moment, so therefore your customers will either be uh, buying another product or not be interested in it yet. Meaning that if you sell a summer coat uh, at the end of summer, no, nobody will buy it. It's as simple as that. Then execution. Without a proper execution, it doesn't matter how brilliant or how good your product is. You can also put this in another way. It doesn't matter how good you think your product is or how good the product is. It's how good you can prove the product to be or the solution. And that all lies in the planning and execution of your strategy. And that is something that, uh, that uh, goes into this uh, body form of the, of the chicken model. You need to be able to run with it at the right time in order to actually have success. And then always hard work. There's no easy way to success. If there was a recipe, I wouldn't be standing here. I would be living in the Hamptons in a nice summer house, as we talked about earlier. If there was a you know a step-by-step -step recipe of making it a success, it would be just looking it up on the internet, and all of us will be millionaires, and that would be very easy. But that will not be fun. The hard work is part of it. So, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. But um, uh, so so the. So there are these two names, Createc, which is the incubator, I'm going to get a little bit down, no, which is the, 
the incubator part. And there you uh, apply for it, uh, and then you get uh, selected to be part of our incubator program, where we'll offer you the stuff that I mentioned earlier. Stardust is uh, this uh, non-profit volunteer organization that manages CreaCheck, and there everybody can apply if you just want to know more about entrepreneurial network in Denmark and the entrepreneurial stage outside of DTU. Um, since you already are taking courses in it, I, I guess you understand the entrepreneurial process here at DTU. Um, and of course, uh, being part of uh, Stardust gives you an opportunity to meet a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and other universities. It gets you uh, a chance to meet all of our mentors and uh, our collaborative partners. So if, if you don't know necessarily what your business uh, is right now, this could be a very good way of meeting people that can inspire you to actually take the next step. Did that way faster than I expected. But I think the, the going away point is for especially this class is this uh, slide. So if it is you are in the early stages of uh, making your company, at some point it would be beneficial for you to apply for our incubator program. Because we have one of the best law firms in Denmark, we have one of the best auditing firms in Denmark, and we have what I see the deepest technical uh, mentoring program in Denmark also. We should be uh, giving you everything away on a silver platter for free, and we don't take any away from you. So, any questions? Yep. How and when do we apply? So, it, it, it's always uh, up to you when you apply. Right now, since we are prototyping it, uh, we only started it uh, January, and we took it away from, uh, it's a fusion of what we saw at uh, Stanford University and what we have seen at uh, CBS. So we are finding out how it actually fits with DTU. So after the summer, there will be an application program and there will be uh, when to apply. How it, uh, when you apply, depending on where you are and with your company, is totally up to you. If you see a problem with uh, starting up your company in the early stages and you would like uh, to spar with our uh, business developer, you can do that without applying. Uh, you can simply just email us and we can set up a meeting and he has, uh, accepted to come out here and sit half a day a week, just sparring with the general D2 students. So the early stages, you don't really need to apply, you still gain some of our resources. Then later on, when you need to uh, figure out if it has to be an APS or one-man company or limited or whatever, then it could be beneficial for you because then you start having a, a team of lawyers and uh, accountants that can help setting up the company and forming it correctly so when you need the funds to go big, you don't get a big... Uh, bill from tax or anything like that. So it all depends on where you see the problems and where your skill sets are, are lacking. It also, if uh, on our webpage, you can actually see the list of mentors. So if you, uh, for instance, one of our startups right now are actually really well into uh, to their company and already looking to uh, establish a, a test facility in Africa, but they needed uh, one of uh, the best uh, researchers in uh, agriculture in Denmark. So in order to test the feasibility of their product, they actually needed to find a mentor that could go in early stage and say, what, how good is the product? Because I believe it's good, they believe it's good, but how can we prove it's good? On another stage, another company who just needed a business developer to look at it and say, okay, in your business strategy, you need to put emphasis on this to find funding. So it all depends on where is your skill set, depending on what it is you're looking for. If one of the groups here wants to start the Create Tech program, do they have to wait to the end of the summer to put in the application form? You can always email us and we will uh, try and respond as fast as possible. Okay, so if they email you, and is there any prerequisites? I mean, if they're a group with a potential business, they have to tick any boxes to be able to accept onto the program? So, in order to uh, be accepted into the program, you need to have affiliation to DTU, meaning that you're either a DTU student or a DTU student within the last five years, or you're working out of a DTU patent. Uh, that's actually our only requirements in order to fulfill you know, the checkbox. Other than that, it's more or less convincing uh, the team that uh, you are passionate about it. Because when, when we're looking at it, we also look at these key factors. Is, is the passion there? If you can convince us that you are really burning for it, because I cannot judge your solution. I'm not a specialist in mechanical engineering or biochemistry or whatever our other startups have, but I can feel their passion for, for the product. 
and I can see how their planning is. So if you can convince me that the planning and the timing and your passion is there, then I'm pretty sure the rest of the team will also be convinced. Expect some email again. Yeah, <laughs> we already like we have uh, five startups now, and we already received uh, more than 15, and we, this is our second PR about it. How so, much room do you have? Uh, we're planning on expanding to 2,500 square meters. Okay. Oh. But uh, we don't know that yet, so it's more wait and see. So therefore, I say after summer because then I will know if we have more room. But there are still more room in our office for, for one or more startups, depending on how big the startups are, of course. So any more questions for Christopher from the students? Okay, then uh, I think we'll uh, give Christopher a hand and thank him for a very nice introduction to the uh, interesting conversation. Okay, okay. I think I don't have to tell you that a lot of the stuff that Christopher just told you can be used by you. <laughs> uh, especially the, the stuff about the, getting help from a lawyer is actually something that will be very relevant to a later part of uh, my lecture today, uh, where I'll be talking actually this part here about uh, how to start a company where you'll actually be needing a lawyer for getting the documents in order and, and getting everything set for, uh, for launching the company. So um, I'll proceed with that. Um, well. First of all, I'd like to you know, just uh, put a few words on why to start a company, because obviously there are some practical reasons for it. Um, uh, obviously, it's something about, uh, in many cases, uh, having an idea, but you know there's a risk involved, and you don't want to risk your car and your house and your couch on account of, the, of a company that could go wrong. So, uh, so in that relation, it's, uh, it's smart to do a, you know, a, an, create a, an entity that's uh, separate from your own stuff. Um, in most cases, you pretty much have to actually get, start a company for you to get an investment because otherwise, and this is something that uh, Shannon Lerke can probably confirm, otherwise you'll get problems with regard to uh, taxes, for instance. Um, and finally, you know, as a, as, a, as a company, you don't have to pay uh, VATs, MOPs, as it's called in Denmark, and that, of course, enables you to save some money on investing into equipment and testing and buying from suppliers, things like that. But really, that's not the reason why you should start a company, at least not to my opinion. Uh, those are the practical reasons, but the, the important reasons are the ones I list down here. Um, first of all, many people actually uh, like the fact that they could be their own boss. And that, you know, in itself, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, but um, when you start to think about it, uh, as an entrepreneur, you get to react upon things happening in society, uh, and you get to do you get to be the first person or the first company to address those things. So you are essentially the one who can uh, create change in the society and make a difference out there. And I have a lot of friends who really who really enjoy working in large Danish companies, and to a large extent, that's what we've been being taught at the at the DTU. Um, uh, the problem is, in many cases, you don't have a very clear uh, relation between the effort you put in and the output you get out. So that, you know, this product was a success, but I was one out of 5,000 other engineers working on it. So, you know, my part of this is a success, mm, not necessarily that, uh, is not necessarily that clearly understood. But uh, nevertheless, uh, some people like that, I definitely prefer having a very clear uh, relation between the effort I put in and the output and the successes that you get out of it. Of course, the uh, flip side of that is that uh, it doesn't always go, uh, go uh, your way, so uh, it's always also, there's also a very clear uh, connection between what you've done and uh, <laughs> the potential for failure, so let's not talk too much about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll start out also with a good reference that, uh, that we all know because uh, uh, something happened last week and that uh, made me think of uh, bringing up this case once again. Because um, uh, I went on the internet and I found a pretty... Uh, what the heck is going on here? Like that. I found a pretty interesting video of uh, 
I think it's from 2009. One second. I've got a cover. I just have to unmute it here. <laughs> Sorry for the wait. Because, uh, well, I think, uh, Tom, you shared the news on, uh, on the website just a few days back, uh, well, last Friday probably, about uh, the recent success of Podio. Uh, they'd actually been uh, sold to uh, an American company, I think, called Citrix. And uh, you're all going to participate in the Venture Cup Hopefully, uh, you know, some of you will succeed in the Venture Cup. Um, the reason I want to show you this video, okay, Danish, thank you. Yes, that's the sound we want to hear, believe it or not. As I said, this is from 2009. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, that didn't really load all that well. One second. It's nice because we have some time to spare. I thought it came preloaded. <laughs> okay, uh, so maybe I'll uh, jump around the, this video. Uh, just to summarize it, this is uh, the old CEO. I think this is one of the, who was the guy who was out here talking? Um, he, um, he essentially starts at what was called Hoist and later became, well, this company you know, Podio. And uh, they got an investor. Uh, that's another guy who will be appearing later in the video. <laughs> I'll do a summary here. And uh, his name is Alas. Uh, I think he put in, uh, uh, well, a few millions. Uh, not, not too much uh, money, actually. But here, two years later, um, well, obviously, it's been a success because if I go back to my lecture here, As I said, Citrix just bought Podio, and the rumor says that they bought it for a nine-digit number, so number, so somewhere over a hundred million kroner, and uh, and that essentially started as you know uh, some guys uh, wanting to address a need. They wanted to do another way of collaborating, uh, and they got an investor, and it's only two years back or something like that. They were in Venture Cup. And today they sold their company for over a hundred million. So uh, that's just a, a very good case of uh, how well it can go. So what I'm essentially saying, you know, a startup, a startup is a, a high risk venture, but it's also a high yield venture. So that's where you can also, you know, make a huge different and difference and make a lot of money. So that's also something that motivates at least some people. Um, from a, from, a, from a societal standpoint, there's also a reason, to, uh, reason for going into uh, entrepreneurship. Um, actually, the Danish government, each year it puts out this uh, thing called Evaxeta Index, well, which is essentially an index for entrepreneurship in Denmark. And uh, if you look at that index, uh, you actually, you're very surprised with the numbers because it turns out that the companies in Denmark that are 10 years or younger actually account for more than half of the job creation in Denmark. So we're talking, you know, an industry that really does a huge difference from, uh, for Denmark as a whole. And if you look back, this graph I put in, the green columns uh, represent the job creation by startups and the white columns represent 
the job creation by, well, older firms in this context, older firms is defined as firms that are older than 10 years. And as you see, consequently, over the last uh, 20 years, startups have been creating jobs for Denmark. And uh, in that same period, uh, these big firms, these big established firms, well, have done, you know, some years they've created a lot of jobs, some years they've, you know, uh, <clears throat> terminated a lot of jobs. So it changes a lot. So from a societal standpoint, you'll definitely also be making a difference. Um, and, and it's also, in Denmark at least, I think there are a lot of cultural uh, misconceptions about uh, what it means to be an entrepreneur and uh, what is possible, what's not possible. Um, first of all, I think many of you, hopefully you're starting to get another idea that many of you would be thinking that, you know, if I start up by myself, I'm pretty much left to my own devices. I can't go anywhere for help. I can't, you know, uh, I'll just have to risk it myself. That couldn't be farther from the truth. You've just heard about uh, Christopher's organization, Startups DTU, and the Korea Tech Incubator. Later, you'll be having, you'll be uh, uh, given a lecture by two very interesting organizations as well. And I think we've mentioned a lot of interesting organizations throughout the course as well. So there are a lot of different opportunities for guidance and for help out there, and also for financing. And, and there's also another misconception, which is, well, a really bad one. Denmark isn't really a good place to start up in. Well, that's not at all true because uh, there's been several, um, several international surveys uh, over the last, I'd say, five years to 10 years uh, and um, on entrepreneurship um, and the prerequisites for entrepreneurship. And it turns out that in many cases, Denmark actually comes out, out on top. I think one of the surveys a few years back actually had Denmark coming out on top. Uh, so uh, Denmark is definitely a good place uh, for starting up. And finally, why should I start up? Why is my idea better than anyone else's? Well, I'll tell you what, you're the engineers. You're the ones with the ideas. This is, if, you should, if it's not starting at DTU or a place like that, where the heck should it start? <laughs> and you've even uh, gone through the, you know, the steps of evaluating your idea, you've uh, done the market research, you've established a customer need and things like that. Believe me, you are as qualified as anyone else for starting up a company. So uh, that, should, that should definitely not stop you. Um, there are some, some, some things to, uh, to remember as well. And I've uh, been personally uh, you know, affected by some of these issues. Um, if you start a certain type of company, um, a privately held company, for instance, uh, for instance, if, if something goes wrong, let's say if your wind turbine uh, falls from a roof and uh, hits a car, uh, you are liable. That means that um, if the company cannot pay for that bill that's you know, from the insurance company, uh, then you have to pay for it. And if you can't pay for it, the, you know, you'll have to uh, put in your car or uh, sell your couch or house or something like that. So that's, that's the flip side of things. But you know, that can definitely be handled and you can get insurances for, for things like that. The next thing is that uh, unemployment is a bit of a hassle, but it's not too bad. The thing is that if you have a company and you really like this company and you think that it could be a success, as you all know, getting money is hard and there will, there will be periods where you don't have money. And you would think that you could just go uh, into unemployment and get the benefits from the Danish state. It's not really how it works. Uh, at least if you own more than 10% of your company, you could get into problems there. You should be aware of that. Um, also, if you ho have your own company, there's some tax stuff that you need to uh, get in order. Uh, each year you have to fill in a, an extended tax form so that uh, your earnings from the company are registered, things like that. And also, as Christopher mentioned, on starting a uh, a shareholder company, for instance, a limited company, you, um, you have to do some papers, things like that. But I'll get more into that later. And also, the last point is, well, I might just have said, I may just have said that uh, being an entrepreneur enables you to, at some point, maybe get a lot of money out of it. That's not how it's going to be in the early stages, because you'll be uh, getting money from an investor or from your family, from Kickstarts or something like that. And you can't really expect them to want to pay for an exorbitant fee for you uh, working on it. So the pay is not going to be very good in the initial stages of your company's existence. So 
that aside, uh, there are a few different ways of uh, starting a company or uh, different types of companies that uh, you could consider. And I encourage you to just revisit this as I when I uploaded on uh, CampusNet to, to look further into it. I won't get too far into it. There is a very important thing to, to, uh, to re look at in this uh, particular uh, table. The thing is that you have essentially two basic types of company. The personally owned company or the IS, uh, which is not a company owned by a single person, but a company owned by several persons. In both those cases, these persons or this person owning the company are liable so that they have to provide collateral, collateral to the company. For instance, you know, if something goes wrong, it's their car or your car that's, uh, that's uh, up for grabs. Um, if you have these companies over here, the limited types, and you see the, the uh, English uh, corresponding titles down here, um, it's different. The credits or the person you owe money can only take this sum of money, either 80,000 or 500,000 uh, kroner. Um, of course, that also means that you have, when you start the company, you have to actually have that money within the company. So that, of course, is, a, is a, a bit of a hassle. But um, in many cases, you actually see that the investors want you to do companies like this because the investors are essentially in the same situation as you. If they go into your company, they're also liable. So they want you to have a company like this. And also, if you have these limited companies, there's a lot of reporting you have to do. You have to leave in an annual report. You have to, uh, well, there are all kinds of different things that you have to manage along the way. But it's not really that tough if you just uh, have an overview of it. I'm not going to provide that overview too much today, but uh, it's uh, something that you can do. I'll be showing you some pages that will, web pages that will give you a, a good uh, oversight. So, uh, moving a bit further into the different company types. This personally owned company, so the IS, which is the one owned by several persons, um, are, you know, in many cases interesting if you just want to have something on the side, if you have a job, and you want to do something on the side of that. Um, <clears throat> actually, if the turnover of the company is less than, less than 50,000, you don't even have to establish a company. You can just do it as a private person. Um, uh, actually, this website here is going to be really interesting to you. Uh, Virk.dk, which is, I suppose, a short for uh, Virksomhed.dk. And Virksomhed means, means uh, well, company in Danish. Um, on that page, you can go in and essentially register a company in like 15 minutes. It also has a lot of really good guides for which company type to choose and uh, how to go through all the, the steps of, of creating that company. Um, again, I mentioned the collateral earlier, and uh, one thing that's very important to note is that, for instance, let's say that you are four persons starting a company, and one of the persons doesn't actually own anything. Uh, you, uh, you actually uh, provide collateral on a solidary basis, as in, well, if this guy can't pay, you have to pay for him. So uh, remember things like that. That's actually pretty important. So for the APS or AS, in, in you know, 99% of your cases, you'd be considering an APS because an AS is just overkill at this stage, and there are only like a few very minute and specific advantages of having an AS and not an APS. And I won't get too much into that. Actually, I haven't the slightest idea of exactly what those, those advantages are because it's not really relevant to you at this stage. Um, in this case, of course, you have to put in the money. You have to put in either 80,000 or 500,000 kroner on the bank account. And you have to have the involvement of an auditor or a, a lawyer for actually vouching for you, saying that we have this money registered in a bank account, and you can uh, create a company on that uh, basis. Also, you have to have uh, certain documents. You have to have a shareholder agreement. You have to have, uh, uh, I don't recall the exact name for it, but you have to have like the rules of the company, uh, the codes of conduct, and things like that. And again, brilliant. it's brilliant that uh, Christopher mentioned that to you, because that would be something that the lawyer could uh, help you with through maybe Startup's DTU. Um, and again, this is the preferred company type for, for many investors. They don't want to be, you know, they're the ones who will be able to pay. So 
if you're in a case of, for instance, starting an IS and no one within you know, the group or in, within the team can actually pay, the investor would have to pay. So they're not really interested in, uh, in that uh, construction. And what I'd like to do now is actually uh, ask um, each of the groups uh, to sit around the tables. I think your group, with your groups at the table, and uh, I'd, want, I'd like to have you, uh, well, do this, uh, discuss essentially which type of company would be interesting to you at uh, this stage. Will you be do it, uh, doing it sort of as something on the side, or will you be doing it as a full-blown kind of uh, commitment? Uh, will you be doing it at all? Maybe some of you don't, are not interested in, in proceeding with this, and maybe only one person in the group is uh, interested, and then maybe it should be just a personally held company. So you have uh, five minutes for that, and uh, we'll just uh, do a quick uh, follow-up on that right after. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, I'd love to hear some, uh, some inputs on that. Um, mm. Any groups uh, want to volunteer to, uh, to, uh, to uh, give uh, their input on uh, what they discussed? Should we start with the group down here? I can be pretty sure of that. Yeah. And what about the, um, the share capital? In that case, that would be 80,000 kroner. How would you <laughs> go around that? Also, by investors. Or by the way, it's very important. I, I don't think I mentioned that, but uh, actually, if you spend money on a patent, something like that, you can actually put that into the company as capital. You would have to have an auditor evaluate it. Uh, for instance, we did that when I started my company. We had a patent that accounted for, I think, maybe forty or 50,000 of you know, uh, the initial share capital of the company. And it could also be like equipment. It could be a computer or it could be a car, <laughs> uh, as long as it's you know, relevant to the company, I, I suppose. So that's also a way of going about it. In your case, patent would be you know, uh, a pretty relevant thing at an early stage. Um, OK, uh, you up here? Any, uh, yeah, what did you we'll discuss? We'll talk about the APS, um, but we do have a little question here. Um, if you if you use the patent patent to uh, to uh, you know, a value um, in your company, would that be uh, audited every year, or if it, if the value goes down or up? No, I think you would have the initial value, so we would be part of that, and you you have uh, essentially. Uh, uh, you know, an auditor valuation where you say that, okay, if the creditor takes something in the company, they could also essentially take the patent. So, uh, so you know, that's, that's how it would work. I don't think you reevaluate the value of it. Is, is it the same thing with a car? Um, or a computer? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I think uh, the car is probably a bad example. And I think the computer is as well because they, you know, they depreciate quite quickly. Uh, but if it would be sort of production equipment, uh, or something like that, that would be more relevant. I have a comment for that. Yeah. The guy who started in one, he uh, put up his uh, motorbike for his company, the lady I did? <laughs> okay, there you go. We just need to be very good friends with it. Be yeah, exactly. It's, it's, that's, that's, a very, that's a very important, uh, that's a very important dimension. Some auditors won't even, you know, what even give you a second of uh, his attention if you ask or something like that? Some of them are, yeah, sure, <laughs> let's go for it. So uh, that's, uh, I suppose, a different, uh, a lot of possibilities there. Okay, um, let's have you take one more and then more and then proceed. Okay, at the back. Uh, we were thinking about, I don't know if it was earlier in this course, but we have, we have seen this schema where it would be beneficial to have a holding company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Providing the capital, and then it would be easier to, to distribute whatever between the holding company and the, the different personal companies. Mm -hmm. I don't have any experiences with holding companies, but essentially what you're doing is uh, you're again passing on the liability to uh, an entity, uh, and 
And uh, the way I understand it, and if any of you have an input on this, uh, the holding company, you would still have to invest, you know, you would have to have a, you know, a, a capital, uh, a share capital in the holding company that can be taken by, you know, creditors. Otherwise, it would just be a way around the whole thing. So it would still cost you some money to, to establish it. But I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, into the specifics of a holding company. I, I, I must admit that. One of the reasons was uh, it was easier to, to distribute the, the revenue between the companies with less tax mm -hmm. than if you own it personally. Yeah. It would give you a larger freedom. freedom. Mm -hmm. It's a relation to exit strategies like Podio if you make 100 million. So you can really. Yeah, it. sure. Uh, I think that advice came from um, the pre Venture Cup lecture last Wednesday on creating an A-team. The uh, presenter was an ex-CEO um, of the Venture Cup. Um, and she said if she was a team or part of a team, she would uh, register a holding company for the Venture Cup with each individual having a sub-company. Um, and I think it's one, one reason or way that you can each get a, a company for a, a general sum of money, which you all share between you and the holding company. Um, I'll try to get some more details on that from her um, and a few more uh, reasons why she suggests that's the best way to go. Cool. That'd be great, Tom. Thanks for that. Cool. Uh, let's move on. I uh, just wanted to quickly mention uh, this resource I already did, uh, Vieckdeco, which is a really uh, cool website that has a lot of, unfortunately, Danish uh, guides for, uh, for everything related to starting a company. Not a holding company, though. Um, and also, there are some, obviously, also some other practicalities that you need to remember. Uh, it would be nice to have a place to sit. <laughs> Just because you have a company, it doesn't mean you have a place to sit. You could sit at home. But uh, often, it's nice to, you know, maybe get uh, a, an agreement with an incubator or something like that. Um, and uh, the domain name is always good to have. Uh, the email, you know, if I have something, something at, dot, uh, at hotmail.com, it's not really uh, the most convincing uh, setup uh, you can imagine. And you don't have to pay all that much for actually getting a, uh, an email with the company name. Uh, and also, just uh, getting a, a domain name for your company isn't necessarily very expensive. I think I'm paying probably three or 400 kroner a year for, for my domain name. So that's not really, uh, that's not the, the main concern, uh, financially at least. Um, phone system and business cards, ob obviously those uh, things also become relevant at some point. And there's one point missing here. I realized that just when I was uh, driving out here. Um, it's always nice to have a bookkeeping system. And for that purpose, you know, for managing uh, invoices, for managing costs, and uh, for managing, you know, if you have employees, wages, things like that. And you have a lot of interesting systems. Please ask me if you have any questions regarding that. There's one called Economic that I've been spending, uh, that I've, uh, you know, used for, for bookkeeping. And you also have... Uh, Meconomy and all kinds of different uh, bookkeeping systems that may be relevant to you. So, any questions? Nope, not really. I think we'll take, uh, yeah, there's a question back there. If you ever consider making an IS or something like that, it's very important that you either use some uh, law firm or something to go through your contract because uh, if yeah. you ever get the uh, in a fight against rules, then it's nice that the rules are... That's, that's, that's a very important point because the main difference between a personally owned company and an IA is essentially that you have a contract between the persons owning the company. And obviously that contract has to... You could actually just have an oral contract, uh, but that's not really uh, something that you can hold people up on at a later stage. So it's always uh, good to have something that's pretty well defined so that, okay, what happens if someone doesn't want to be part of this anymore? Can we sack a partner? Things like that. So uh, a contract is very important also in an IS. Yep. Is it uh, very difficult to go from one form to another? Like if you're expanding and maybe you want to go... No, it's, you, you have to go through the same steps, essentially. And it's about, you know, transferring capital from one, one firm to another. Uh, and... Uh, you go, as I said, through many of the same steps. And in many cases, you would go, for instance, start out with an IS and then go to an APS. And also, I just I read an article about there being a lot of you know, uh, tax benefits from going 
uh, from an APS to an IS if you're in a situation where that actually makes sense. So you could, you know, you see people jumping a bit back and forth. Um, the, the good thing is that as soon as you have the capital in one construction, it's easy to go to the other because you don't have to raise that capital. So, cool. Let's take a 10 uh, minute break and uh, be back here at just past, let's say, something called 33, a bit, a few minutes past uh, half. Cool, if that makes sense. <laughs>